all right. So uh, the last lecture uh, of today uh, will be given by uh, Professor Ronit Rubinfeld. Uh, Ronit is an absolute expert in Sabrina algorithms. In fact, she uh, co-invented the term Sabrina algorithms. Uh, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce her talk, which will be a surprise about Sabrina time algorithms. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start with some motivation. The motivation is you have these, you know, data sets um, that are so large, so huge that there's no time to view all of the data before you have to come up with a solution. Okay, so this is huge data. Uh, and let me just have like an example to keep in your head of a data set that's so, so big that um, that you can't actually go and view all of the data set. Um, and that would be like the social network of the whole world where each node represents a person in the world and you put an edge between people that actually know each other, but over the whole world, okay? So there's this thing, the famous small world property. Um, and there's this property of it that um, is often referred to as six degrees of separation which in our language of computer science says that the diameter of this graph um, on the whole world is six, okay? So it means that like in the graph of, I know you know, I know a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend, I can get to anybody in six steps, okay? And it's such a famous um, hypothesis that there was a movie made out of it, which I watched this movie and I, I don't really understand how it relates to this hypothesis at all, but it does share the name and it talks, it says six degrees of separation a lot in the, but I, I never, maybe I'm not, maybe I don't get a literature too well, but I, I, I didn't get it. In, in any case, that is the, the name of the movie. Um, and in fact, there were the, um, there were attempts to try to prove that this is an actual property of the graph, um, but how would we, try to make sure that that is the property of the graph. I mean, how do we know that the world's diameter is six? Uh, the data collection problem is immense. Um, by the time you're done collecting the data, people die, people are born. Uh, there might be actually unknown groups of people. I think I, that hasn't happened in a while, but when I was growing up every so often, they would find these lost tribes in some kind of middle of a rainforest somewhere. And they, so there might be disconnected components that we don't know about until we know about them and then they're not disconnected anymore. Um, so there was an experiment by, um, a famous experiment by Stanley Milgram in 1963, attempting to verify whether um, we have the small world property. And he did some experiment that was um, interesting and it had an interesting result, but people still argue about what that actually means. And people retried these experiments. And actually, by the way, Stanley Milgram is associated with the name six degrees of separation, but this has been studied since the early 1900s uh, by various people. So um, it is something that's been kicking around. Okay, so what I hope this, ex what this example shows you is this gold standard of linear time algorithms. When, you know, when we teach our algorithms course in this room um, and a, we tell people, okay, you have a linear time algorithm, you can stop now because that's the best you can do. Um, and now you get an A plus because you got the linear time algorithm. That's actually may not be adequate in all settings. Okay, so that's kind of depressing because if it's not adequate, what could you possibly hope to do if you don't get to view most of the data? You only get to see some small, very small, tiny fraction of the data. What can you hope to do even? Um, so you can't answer sort of exact type questions like for all, um, for all pairs of people in the earth, they're connected by a path of at most at length sixth, or there exists type questions or exactly type statements. Um, for example, exactly how many individuals on earth are left-handed? It's constantly changing, but it's also not something you could even hope to answer. But maybe you could answer some kind of approximation. For example, is there a large group of individuals that's connected by at most six degrees of separation is the average pairwise distance in a graph, roughly six, um, approximately how many individuals on earth are left-handed. So these approximations um, are something you could hope to do. Okay, so if you can't view most of the data, we're gonna have to compromise somehow. 
we're, for most interesting problems, the algorithms need to give some sort of approximate answer. And if we get to it, I'll talk about more than one type of approximation. I'm gonna start with kind of the usual notion of approximation today um, and probably the beginning of tomorrow. Um, and if I'm lucky, I'll get to other kinds of approximation as well. Okay. Um, so just to say, you know, like statisticians ran into this problem a long time ago. So they, we know that we can sample to get an approximate average. We know um, that there are standard algorithms for approximating the median value. So there are things we can do, but what I wanna talk about today are things that are say more algorithmically um, interesting or to go beyond these questions to questions about combinatorial um, optimization and graph theory. And uh, I won't talk about it today, but uh, people have looked at this for algebraic types of properties and uh, various other things. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm, my plan is to give some examples. I wanna start with some very simple, a very simple example um, on estimating the diameter of a point set. Um, and then I'm gonna go to something um, slightly more intricate is estimating the average degree of a graph. So it's supposed to say average degree, that's not the degree. Um, and, um, and then estimating the number of connected components in a graph. And if I have time, estimating the minimum spanning tree weight in certain kinds of graphs. Okay, and tomorrow, what I wanna talk about is more general techniques for how you could develop um, sort of these techniques that have given us lots of sublinear time algorithms. And one is based on developing sublinear algorithms from just taking off the shelf really fast parallel algorithms, which is kind of an area that's been very exciting recently. A lot of very, very fast parallel algorithms have been developed and there is now a reduction that takes those parallel algorithms and turns them into sublinear time algorithms. So I'm gonna talk about that a bit. And then I'm going to talk about how to take greedy algorithms. And sometimes you can turn those into sublinear time algorithms. And then finally, I'm going to close with an example from property testing, which is a different type of approximation. Okay, it's to test if your graph has a certain property and what do we mean with that? Okay, so it's not actually to estimate some parameter and get a good, um, you know, two approximate, two multiplicative approximation of that parameter, but it's a different sort of uh, approximation. So that's the plan for today and tomorrow. And we'll see what happens because I have no idea how long this is going to take. Okay, so let's first do a very simple example. Um, it's deterministic. It's gonna give an approximate answer um, and it's gonna be sublinear time. It's the only example um, that I, that I you know, I'm gonna show you that's deterministic. Everything else is gonna be randomized. Um, and a, in fact, it's about approximating the diameter of a point set. So here we're given M points um, and the description is gonna be a distance matrix D, capital D, okay? So the IJ entry of this matrix is the distance from I to J, okay? So this is a matrix and I'm gonna assume that D satisfies the triangle inequality and symmetry. So you could just think about the upper half of the matrix if you want, um, but it also satisfies triangle inequality and that is really important. Okay, now another thing I just wanna say, it's an M point, it's a matrix describing distances between M points. So its size is M squared. So our input size N is going to be M squared. Just to, um, I just want, just to remind you here, we're going for sublinear in N, not in M, okay? Um, all right, so let IJ be the indices that maximize um, DIJ. Okay, now there's some entry in this matrix that's the biggest. That is the diameter of the matrix. That's a definition, okay? And we wanna estimate that diameter. Now, if this was an arbitrary matrix, finding the biggest entry in a matrix, I have to search through the whole thing. I mean, there's nothing um, I can do but that. And even if I wanted two approximation or a million approximation, I really have to search through the whole thing because everything might be zero except one place. But we get help here because we satisfy the triangle inequality. So this is not an arbitrary matrix, okay? And that's what we're gonna make use of, okay? So our goal is, in fact, what we're gonna be able to do is to output 
some entry in this matrix, we're going to find some entry who it may not be the diameter of the matrix, it may not be the biggest, but it's going to be at least half the size of the biggest. So it's going to be a two multiplicative approximation. Okay, that's the goal. All right. Okay, so here's the algorithm. Thanks, Piot, for this algorithm. Uh, and the algorithm is going to be, I'm going to just pick a starting point arbitrarily, k. If you want, set k equal to the first node in the graph, okay? I mean, the first point in the, in the space, okay? And now, so I picked k. That's a row in the matrix. I'm going to go down the row and find the biggest entry in that row. The biggest entry is um, going to give me L that maximizes DKL. So this is the farthest point from K. L is the farthest point from K. And I'm just gonna output DKL. That's it. That's the whole algorithm, okay? What's the running time of this thing? I just go down a row. The row, I have only M points, and this is an M by M matrix. So it's gonna take me order M time to find the maximum, which is square root the size of the matrix. So this is square root n, where n is the size of the input. Okay, so it's sublinear time. I saw very little of the input, but I have something to output. Now the question is, did I output something good? I mean, what can I say about DKL? Why is this a good thing? Because uh, why should this be anywhere near the maximum? Okay, so why it works is this. Suppose the real diameter is between i and j. Maybe those are the farthest two points. All right, so i and j are the farthest two. Now, I, do you see? Okay, great. Okay, so i and j are the farthest two. But look, um, by triangle inequality, if i went to k and then to j, um, that has to be at least as big as going straight from i to j, right? Okay, so we can say that dij is at most dik plus dkj, um, but we picked l so that it's the farthest point from K, therefore, this DKI can be at most DKL. It, it's at most DKL, and DKJ is also at most DKL. So right here, um, DIK, okay, so DIK is at most DKL, DKJ is at most DKL. I used both triangle and, I mean, so I, I used um, the way we chose L to be the maximum point, I mean, the, the farthest from K as well as symmetry, because I had to move, um, you know, we use some symmetry here, the DIK equals DKI. All right, so, uh, so that's all we used, and we're now done, because we've just shown that DKL is at least DIJ over two, which was the goal, okay? So this is a simple example, but it's meant to show you that some, you know, that, that sublinear time isn't such a crazy notion, okay? So that's the, uh, um, that's the example. Any questions on this example before I move on? Yeah. What's that? If you pick that row arbitrarily, how would this algorithm Oh, if, I'm not picking it randomly. You, you t I, actually, picking k to be one works. Any k that you want, but one would work. Um, so maybe next time I give this talk, I'll just say k equals one. Yeah. I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay, cool. Is it the best we can get? What do you say, Piot? Uh, it's the best. It's the best we can. Cool. Great. So let's go on to another problem. Um, average degree of a graph. Okay. And uh, so I'm, this was actually the result I'm going to present was pretty much given by Fege, but I'm going to give the presentation of Goldberg and Ron um, because I believe it's a little simpler and also. Uh, it's the one that can be extended to do better than what I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to show you the full result. Okay. All right. So what we're interested in now is the average degree of a graph. 
So we were given a graph, and I'm going to assume this graph is simple and no parallel edges, because otherwise it's kind of impossible. Like if you if you were allowed a lot of self loops, then if, um, you could have one node with lots of self loops, and all the other nodes have nothing, no degree. And then finding that node with the self loops is like finding a needle in the haystack. But you have to find it to know the average degree. Okay, so. I have to assume no self loops for the similar reason. I have to assume it's simple. Okay. Um, all right. So D of V is the degree of node V. That's what we're going to use little D of V to denote. Okay. We're going to use little D to denote the degree of a node V and big D to denote the average degree. Okay. So that's our average degree. Um, and I'm also going to assume that there's omega N edges in a graph again, because if I don't assume that, then um, for the same reason as before, that it, I can't get multiplicative approximations if most nodes have degree zero and there's something exciting going on in a very small portion of the graph that kicks up the average degree. Okay, so I have to assume that there's omega n edges. Okay, and I'm gonna say something about the representation of the graph, but uh, I'm actually not gonna use the full power in today's lecture. Okay, so. The representation we're going to assume is adjacency list. Um, that for each V, we're going to store the degree of V followed by a list of its neighbors. And you know, in general, what um, the improvements to today's algorithm would like to do is assume it's in an array of length D of V. But don't worry about it because we're not even going to use it today. We're just really going to assume today that you have degree queries. You can, on V, get the degree of V. That's it, in one step. Okay. Um, everything else with these neighbor queries, being able to get the J's neighbor of V, that's for improvements that I'm not doing today. But, um, I, okay, so let's continue. Um, let's, just, let's just see why naive sampling isn't a good idea. Okay, so if you just did naive sampling, let me just pick a bunch of random nodes, V1, V2, V3, and up to VS. So I pick S nodes in my sample, and then what I'm going to do is return the average degree of the sample. So that seems like you know, the first step. What else can you do, actually, if all you know is the degree of a node? OK, well, the problem is D of V can be anywhere between 1 and n. All right. And if you just use chernoff hufting bounds, the straightforward sampling bounds, you're kind of in trouble because if, you know, you're, if your number can be anywhere between 1 and n, the variance is really high. So you need a lot of samples to get a good estimate of the average. Okay, so that's a problem. But our hope is that these are not, this is not like, you know, when you're looking at the degrees of v, it's not an arbitrary uh, uh, array uh, that contains numbers, but it's actually very specific. So what's specific about um, the degree, the degrees of a, uh, graph. Well, the entries are between zero and n minus one. Okay, we knew that. That doesn't help too much. The sum is two times the average degree times n. That, okay, but also doesn't seem to help that much. But what else is, what else? Yeah, this is what I want to say. Let's just think about some examples. A regular graph would have um, the same, a regular graph would have the same number in each entry. Okay, that's not too exciting, but this is not possible. Having n minus one, zero, 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 zero is not possible. That would be a real problem. Like that would be the lower bound for why I can't estimate the average entry of an array, right? Um, but that doesn't happen in a graph, all right? Although n minus one, 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 one is possible, that would be the star graph. That could happen. Um, I can have a lot of zeros, though. If I have a lot of zeros, though, um, I have to have some sort of structure in what's left. These guys have to be like cliques of some sort or some high degree thing. Some, those edges have to go somewhere, and they have to find another node to get to. Okay, so somewhere you have to account for all the other endpoint of each node. You can't just have like an arbitrary big guy with no other, with no other um, uh, implications. Okay, so that's what we're going to use here. All right, so first I'm going to start with a lower bound to show you why you can't just do this, say, in con like you might say, okay, I want to do it in constant time. I'm in a rush. Let me do it. And I'm going to say, forget it. You can't do it in constant time. In fact, you're going to need root n time. 
to do this, okay? Why is that? Well, here are two graphs. Um, the end cycle, which has average degree two, and the slightly smaller than end cycle. Let me take out something like C times root n nodes and have a cycle on n minus C times root n nodes, okay? And then on those other C times root n nodes that I took out, let me put a clique there, okay? Now, the average degree of this guy was two, but the average of degree of this is roughly two plus C squared. That's what, I mean, it turns out you can, it's a simple calculation and it's not quite, it's just, that's why we have these squiggly, the squiggly guy there, but it's very close to two plus C squared is the average degree. The problem is I need something like omega n to the one half queries to find these clique nodes, okay? Cause they could be placed arbitrarily and there's, they're only a one in root n fraction. So I need something like root n queries just to find them. Okay, and that's the lower bound um, for why you do need to um, expect to spend at least root n uh, time on this. And now the question is, is that enough? Okay, and it turns out this is, act uh, this is actually a lower bound, even if I give you the stronger queries, not just for, I mean, I mean, it's very easy to see only if you have degree queries, but if even if you have adjacency queries, like um, what I didn't talk about so much before, even then um, it's still a root and lower bound. Okay, so here's the algorithm of Goldreich and Ron, and here's their idea. So I wanna say, um, I think, so what they do is this. Before the, don't even think about the algorithm right now, but implicitly, group together nodes that have roughly the same degree, okay? But very close approximation. That's their idea, okay? So we're gonna have these buckets. Now, the buckets are gonna contain things that differ by a factor of at most one plus beta. And beta is, um, beta is gonna be something it's less than, I'm trying, okay, I'm gonna go for an epsilon approximation, one plus epsilon approximation. Beta is something less than epsilon by say a constant factor, okay? So beta is, is it really depends on your approximation parameter. So if I group together things in a bucket, everything in the bucket is within one plus beta, which is a lot less than one plus epsilon of each other. And what we're gonna do is just assume they all have the same degree. Okay, so we're bucketing our nodes that have the same degree. Um, and then what we're gonna do is instead of summing up the degrees of all the nodes, we're gonna sum up our estimate of the degrees in each bucket times the size of the bucket. Okay, so, so the total degree of nodes in bucket I is gonna be somewhere between one plus beta to the I minus one times the number of nodes in the bucket, size of B sub I, and one plus beta to the I times the size of beta. So they, they differ just by a factor of one plus beta. Okay, everybody's degree is somewhere in this range. All right, so the total of the degree of the graph is now I'm just gonna sum up over all buckets, size of a bucket times this one plus beta to the I minus one, that gives me a lower bound, and times one plus beta to the I, that gives me an upper bound. Okay, any questions here? Because this is the main idea, that this is like we're summing up over each bucket. This is the lower bound on the total degree from that bucket. And this is the upper bound on the total degree from that bucket. Yeah. Ah, because each node in that bucket has between one plus beta to the I minus one and one plus beta to the I degree. And so I want to, um, take the whole contribution of nodes that have roughly that degree. So this is not some, okay, this is not sum over all the nodes. This is sum over the buckets. Does that help? Okay, good. Okay. Okay, all of this we're doing in our heads so far. The algorithm didn't do anything yet. But um, yeah, so, so far this is just our heads. Okay, however, when I get a node, I'm allowed to query its degree. And then when I get a sample node, I can see which bucket it gets into. So at this point, we have no idea what, I mean, we know what one plus beta is because I, I picked it. <laughs> so that's one thing I know, but we don't know how big these buckets are. 
And that's what we're gonna use our sample to figure out. So that's the, really the only thing left is we just have to figure out how big are each of these buckets. And that's what the algorithm is gonna do, that's it. Okay, so almost we could go home, except not quite. All right, um, so I'm just reminding you what the one plus beta does, is it's supposed to give us the, that's up here, this thing here, it's supposed to give you the approximation. Um, and now these are the parameters we had before. Uh, beta is you know, one plus beta to the i, one plus beta to the i plus one, one plus beta to the i plus two, and these are, there are different buckets. And it's pretty easy to see that when you have exponentially increasing buckets that you only need log n of them. So t is the number of buckets, which I'm never really using in here too much, but um, uh, t, you know, it turns out you only have logarithmically many buckets. So uh, if you need samples to fall in all of the buckets, just add another log factor to your running time and it's probably gonna happen, okay? So that's a, so let's not worry about um, how, I mean, there's not too many buckets, that's the main thing. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take a big sample. And I didn't say how big the sample should be yet, but it's gonna be pretty, it's, um, I can maybe ruin the surprise and say it's gonna be like Rudin and maybe times t so that you get a lot of these. It's, and it's there, and maybe a little bit more, but times another log factor or something like that. But, but roughly you need root n um, so that you hit each bucket root n time. Um, so, okay, so you will see why in a minute. Okay, so um, bi we just defined before, those are the nodes that land in a specific bucket. S sub i is the sampled nodes that fell in bucket b sub i. Okay, so I don't know all the nodes that fell in B sub i. I don't know the size of it, but I do know how many of the sample fell in B sub i. And we're gonna use how many nodes fell in the sample to estimate the size of B sub i. Okay, that makes sense. And so we're gonna use rho sub i to be the fraction of nodes that fell into the ith bucket. And we're gonna use that, and it turns out of course, rho sub i, its expectation is exactly the fraction of nodes in B sub i, um, in the whole graph. So if we can, if we had a good estimate of rho sub i, we actually can get a good estimate of b sub i. So that's great. Okay, and then what we're just gonna do is output this sort of lower bound. We know that everybody in the bucket has degree at least one plus beta, there should be an i minus one there. Um, so we know everybody should have degree at least, there, that i minus one. Um, and we're gonna output this lower bound, one plus beta to the i minus one times rho sub i. Okay. Now, this is going to work really well for buckets that got lots of samples. This is gonna work really badly for buckets that didn't get too many samples, okay? So the buckets that didn't get enough samples, this is a terrible, I mean, this, this rho sub i is gonna be a really bad a, estimate. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, this algorithm is almost the same as what I had on the previous page, but what we're gonna do instead is for those buckets that didn't get enough samples, we're just gonna say rho sub i is zero, okay? And then we're gonna argue later that that's not too bad, but we'll see why in a minute, okay? And what do I mean by not getting too many samples? I mean, buckets that got at least something like um, epsilon over n quantity to the one half um, times uh, divided by ct fraction, okay, so s sub i is Basically this fraction, remember C is just a constant and T is something like log N. So this is like, you could, for, my, for right now, you could just ignore CT. But so we're just saying, this is the fraction, epsilon over N quantity to the one half. If you get that fraction of samples, you're considered a pretty good bucket because you got lots of samples, okay? And if you got that many samples, then take rho sub i to be the size of S sub i over S. If you didn't get that many samples, set rho sub i to zero. This seems like a nutso thing to do. Why would you do that? Like, why, why not just take rho sub i to be what it is? And why would you just get rid of these things? All right. Um, this is, seems like a good time to tell you how many samples we'll need. I mean, I kind of broke my, uh, like I ruined the surprise before, but I just want to say it's roughly this. It's, um, you're going to overall take a number of samples that something like root n over epsilon times this CT, and remember again that T is like log N. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a little bit more than root N over epsilon, okay? So it's, you know, log factor more, O tilde of log N of root N over epsilon, okay? 
And it turns, we're going to show that that's good, at, good enough. Um, so this actually, so what we're going to show is this is good enough to guarantee a good approximation for these buckets that got lots of samples um, or should have gotten a lot of samples. So one thing that's confusing is there's the buckets that are big because they have a lot of nodes and there's buckets that are big because they got a lot of samples. And of course that it seems like that should go together. And it kind of does, but kind of doesn't. But it, so it will make listening to me talk about this prove a little complicated because I'm actually talking about large buckets as being the ones that got a lot of samples as opposed to the ones that should have gotten a lot of samples. And I wanna claim that it's almost the same. So anyway, I just wanna warn you that if I'm confusing, it's because there is something confusing. <laughs> it's, um, it, so, but it, also I wanna say that if you're not clear which one I'm talking about, then um, ask me and I'm happy to talk about it. Okay, all right. So now the biggest question is, if, if we had a lot of samples, this would be a good estimate. That would be great. These guys though, um, we didn't have a lot of samples and then we totally undercounted by setting rho sub i to be zero. So the question is, did we just blow it by making a huge undercount? And why in the world did we do this? Okay, so the idea is, um, the idea that we're gonna show is, for those buckets where we didn't get too many samples, it's because um, they don't have that many nodes in them because we picked random nodes. So if we didn't see too many samples, it must be because they had order of root of epsilon n many nodes. And the, and the ones where we saw a good estimate, it's because they had at least root epsilon n many nodes, okay? So the ones that we set to zero, they didn't have so many nodes. And if they didn't have so many nodes, they couldn't have that many edges, okay? Just notice that epsilon n to the one half, choose two, is at most epsilon n. That was why it was chosen this way, okay? So it's at most epsilon n total edges. And so if we miss those edges, who cares? It like doesn't change our approximation by that much. And that's the main idea of this algorithm. Okay, we're not going to miss any of these guys. So these, these, um, the, the buckets that have at least epsilon root n nodes, we're going to get them. We're going to hit them lots. And we're going to do like, we're going to take enough samples so that we hit those guys with really high probability. And so we can union bound over all of them and say, no, I hit them all. So we're going to get all these guys. Is that, is that your, maybe you were asking a different question. I'm not sure. Okay, so basically these guys, if you're worried that we're not missing, we're not gonna miss these. I may be throwing out some, I mean, I may have missed some logs somewhere, but we're taking enough logs so that we hit everybody here and then with very high probability and then we can union bound and we just got them. These guys, I don't know if I'm gonna see them. I don't know if I'm not gonna see them, but, um, if I undercount them, there's just not that many edges there. They can't do too much. Yeah. Okay, so what, okay, let me, let me go to the next slide. Um, okay, what, I, I'm, I'm gonna answer your question. Um, so basically, okay, maybe I should preview to your question. The question is, um, I wanna say that the buckets that have lots of nodes are all gonna have lots of samples, okay? So if there's a bucket that you don't see lots of samples for, then you can assume it was small, okay? And now between the small guys, there is not any edges, but I, I think maybe the question you're, maybe you guys may be worried about something, which let me get to this next slide. Uh, and I think I, I kind of gave you an idea, but you may be worried about edges that go between big and small um, buckets. Like there, I said something about between small nodes, there's not so many edges, but what about between a small node and a big node? Maybe there's more edges. So let's talk about that. Okay, so there are three types of edges. There are edges that go between large nodes and large nodes. It's like two nodes in large buckets. There are edges that go between one large node and one small node. 
there's, and there's edges that go between two small nodes. Now, these guys, these large, large, both endpoints are in large buckets. So they're gonna get counted twice, once from the one large side and once from the other large side. These guys, the large, small, one endpoint is in a large bucket, but one endpoint is in a small bucket. They're just gonna be counted once, okay? And then there's these small, small, where both endpoints are in small buckets and they never get counted. All right, so let's see how many small, small edges. We just kind of argued this, but let me just re reiterate the argument. Small buckets don't have lots of nodes. Um, I think I'm just gonna say this quickly. I think if you look at those, um, I, I think it's just easier to say, if there were lots of nodes in the bucket, we would have seen a lot of them in the sample, okay? So the only thing that gets set, row set to zero is when there, there weren't actually a lot of nodes in the bucket. So, <clears throat> um, so all small, small edges have to be between buckets with at most epsilon over n to square root of that quantity times some constant times n many no, um, nodes. And if you take, um, if you take all possible edges between these, you get something like epsilon n to the one half many nodes. That should be, sorry, that's the number of nodes. And that gives you, that's the number of total nodes you could possibly have in the small, small. Um, but there's at most, if you take all the possible edges that go between these nodes, it's this many choose two, okay? And that many choose two is at most order epsilon n. Okay, so that's dealing with small, small. That's type three that were never counted. They were never counted, but there's at most epsilon times n many edges there. And we know there, by assumption, there's at least n edges in the graph. Remember that, that we assume that? This is why, this is one of the reasons, okay? All right, all right. So this affects the average degree by at most epsilon additive, epsilon n additive factor, which is an epsilon multiplicative factor. Okay, that's at most that. Now. What about these large, small versus large, large? Well, large, small undercounts by a factor of two at most, okay? So this is giving us a two approximation right away. All right, so this whole thing together, what we just saw gives us a two plus epsilon multiplicative approximation overall. Okay, now this whole thing with the buckets, can this be improved? Yes. It can be improved. I'm not actually gonna show you, but it can be improved. The way you can improve it is you can estimate the fraction of large, small edges in each bucket and then correct for them. And there's like a certain correction. It's like an accept, reject type A. Um, I think there's a better word for it that everybody uses. Maybe somebody remembers what the word is. A, when you a, toss a coin and decide with what probability to accept it. Yes, there's a rejection sampling idea here. Um, so you can do it with rejection sampling. Um, and all you need to be able to do is pick a random edge. And then, um, oh, actually, if you could pick a random edge, you can just do standard sampling. Uh, and it, if you could pick, no, so it's, sorry, it's not standard. You, you do some rejection sampling. And then um, an almost random edge would suffice. Uh, and I wanna say there's um, a way of doing it in Goldrake Ron. There's a simplification in the paper of Eden, Ron, and Sashadri that's really cute. Um, so it kind of takes walks of length two, random, you, a random starting point and you take a walk of length two instead of a, just sort of what you would normally think to do, but it's very cute. Um, anyway, so I just wanna say you can do better. You can get a one plus epsilon approximation. I just didn't show it to you, okay? All right, so that's a, good. So where are we? Oh, we still have time. So I'm gonna show you how to, yeah, questions. Is there Ah, is, can you do it in like time root n as opposed to root n polylog n is the question? Okay, that's a good question. I actually don't know. Uh, I don't know that it's open. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's open or not. I, I don't even know that much. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah. Right, correct. Yes, you do, you do, thanks for asking, yeah. Yeah, that's where the adjacency queries come in. Um, yeah, okay, now I conf this is the time for me to confess that I took these slides from when I used to do it with the adjacency queries and I still had the model up there from the old thing and I didn't get rid, I forgot to get rid of the model. So anyway, that's a, okay, all right, so cool. So um, I'm moving on now to estimating the number of connected components in a graph. Okay, so here, 
again, we're going to assume that we have an input graph and we're going to assume that it has bounded degree um, and the degree is bounded by D. Uh, our running time is going to be in terms of D. So D doesn't have to be a constant, but the running time will depend on D. Um, and we're going to assume it's in the adjacency list representation. Now I don't need to assume that each node has the degree. I don't need anything like that. Um, and we're going to output an additive approximation to within epsilon n of the number of connected components. And we're going to do it in time d epsilon squared log 1 over epsilon. So this won't depend on the number of nodes in the graph directly, only the de max degree. So d think of as the max degree. And you can show that omega d epsilon squared time is required. So this is pretty close to a, a, the best you can do. All right. So what are we going to do? Well, let C be the number of components. For every vertex u, we're going to define this quantity n sub u to be 1 over the size of u's component. OK? And then for any connected component, let's call it A, which is a subset of the vertices, um, if you just summed up this n sub u over all u in this connected component A, what would you get? Well, you get 1 over size of A for each one of these, but you're adding it up size of A times, so you'd get 1, right? Cool. All right. But if you summed this um, u over all nodes in the whole graph, you would get the number of connected components. Okay. So that's what we're going to use. So this seems like, okay, this is an alternate characterization of the number of connected components. Um, and it's like, uh, what good is that? Because if I want to compute this, I have to sum over n nodes, and then I need to do a linear time computation to figure out what n sub u is. So it's an order n squared running time algorithm instead of a linear time algorithm. Why is this an improvement? Okay, so that would be uh, maybe the first question we'd ask. So we're going to actually show you can do this much we can estimate this thing much faster. Um, we're going to not have to go over all possible nodes in the graph. We're going to estimate this sum by sampling and taking an average of the n sub u's. Okay? And we're not actually going to compute these n sub u's precisely. We're going to compute some other sort of a quantity that looks like n sub u most of the time, but doesn't take as long to compute. Um, and, that's how, and it's a good approximation. And so we're going to get um, an approximation two ways, one from just because we're doing random sampling and taking an average, and one because the n sub u's we're computing aren't exactly the, um, the n sub u's we wanted. Okay. All right. So a, that's what I just said. Okay. And the idea is this n sub u, because it's one over the size of the component that u is in, what we're going to notice is um, when the component is really big, then one over, one over the size of the component is kind of really small. So if all I'm looking for is an additive approximation, um, I can stop when I see that it's kind of really big and say, okay, one over n sub u is small. I can stop now. Okay, and that's kind of that's going to be the idea. And that and what that means is it's going to be enough for us. And I, I'm going to show this more precisely in the next slide. But it's going to be enough for us to get kind of perfect or really really good values for one for n for n sub u when the component size is small. But when the component size is small, I can do it quickly. All right. So n sub u is one of the size of u's component. Let's define n sub u tilde to be the maximum of n sub u and epsilon over 2. OK. When the size of u's component is less than 2 over epsilon, remember, so 1 over the size, so so that means our um, n sub u is uh, at least epsilon over 2. Then the maximum thing is going to be the n sub u. So n sub u tilde is equal to n sub u. OK? Otherwise, n sub u tilde is equal to epsilon over 2. All right. Which means that if we look at n sub u minus n sub u tilde, well, they're either the same or because n sub u is positive, but it's less than n sub u tilde, it can differ by at most epsilon over 2. So they're either identical or they differ by at most epsilon over 2. So these things are a good approximation to within epsilon over 2. Um, and if you look at the summation over all nodes in the graph of n sub u, and you use the n sub u tildes instead, then you're going to get something to within plus or minus epsilon n over 2. OK, cool. So 
that's why these NCBU tildes are good enough for us. They're gonna give us an epsilon n over two additive approximation, okay? The other epsilon n over two error we're gonna get from the sampling, okay? All right, so now, I mean, why is this n sub u tilde helping us? Because you can compute it quickly, okay? What, when the size of the component is small, less than two over epsilon, you have to compute it perfectly. But when the size of the component is bigger than epsilon over two, you can just stop and output epsilon over two. Right. So the way we're going to do this is in order d over epsilon time with BFS. Um, actually, let me just say it here. How are we going to compute? I'm going to do a BFS. When I see, um, I either, like, I, um, I take at most epsilon over two steps, or ex, sorry, at most two over epsilon steps. I'm going to start doing BFS and counting the number of people in my component. If, um, if I see that there is more than two over epsilon nodes, I just stop and output n sub u tilde is equal to epsilon over two. I'm done. How much time did that take me? D times uh, two over epsilon time, or I need, I need to take two over epsilon steps to new things, but I need to look at all, maybe I need to look at all my at, um, neighbors each time I take a new step to add in a new a node. So that's why it's D times two, um, order D over epsilon time. Um, and then worse comes to worse, if I was in a smaller component, I would just stop earlier than that and output the, re, um, I would actually output the actual value of n sub u, which is also n sub u tilde. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Oh, I see what you're saying. Is it, uh, okay. Uh, we're assuming it's, um, yes, we're still assuming it's simple graphs. Why am I worried about this? That a, uh, um, I, so you're saying if I see more than D over epsilon, okay, May, you, what you're saying makes sense. Um, this question always comes up and I can't remember if I forgot to change the slide or if a, or if there's something that I'm forgetting. So I have to take this offline, um, but good question. It's a very good question. I just don't remember. And um, I wouldn't trust me to think it through right now. Okay, <laughs> okay, so a, cool. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna, um, to approximate our number of connected components, we're gonna repeat a, order one over epsilon cubed times, pick a random node V, compute N sub tilde of V via BFS, like we just said, and return the average values. And the runtime is D over epsilon to the fourth. Okay, so, uh, oops. So what I wanna say is we get epsilon N over two additive error from using N sub U tilde instead of N sub U. And we get another epsilon N over two additive error because we didn't do this for every single vertex V, but we used a random sample and return the average value. So we'll pick enough random sample to make sure that the error is less than epsilon over two from that part. Okay, and that's the whole thing. That's how you do connected components. Any questions on this? Besides the really good questions I already got? Okay, all right. So now, how did this question even come up? So here's how it came up. Um, suppose you want to estimate the weight of a minimum spanning tree. What's the, um, and just make sure we're all on the same page. Have we all seen minimum spanning tree here? We, I think almost all of us have. It's really just what's the cheapest way to connect the dots in a graph. I just want a tree that has the minimum weight that connects the whole tree, that connects the whole graph. Okay, well, what we're gonna do is given an input graph with weights in the range one through W an average degree D, an adjacency list representation, we're gonna output a one plus epsilon approximation to the MST in this time DW over, over epsilon cubed times this log factor, okay? Where D is the average degree, W is the maximum weight and it's over epsilon cubed. So notice there's no direct reference to the number of nodes in the graph, okay? Uh, so it's sublinear when D times W is little o of the number of edges. Um, it's constant when D and W are bounded by a constant. Um, there's a lower bound of DW over epsilon squared, so we know that's required. And 
a, if you um, have integral weights instead of like um, arbitrary weights in this range, then you can do a tiny bit better, like one of Repson fraction better, okay? Because actually this is the case that we wrote the algorithm for, and then you can extend it to this by sort of rounding to, um, okay? So that's why that is. All right, so I just want one word of caution. The weights are in one through W. So in some sense, what this is saying is the running time is bounded by the ratio of the max to min weight. Okay, uh, so for example, if you took like an under, like if you took the a graph where um, you took sort of the transitive closure and you made the weight the shortest path distances, then you might have like a huge ratio between the min to max weight. So um, I just want to just caution you that it's not always the case that this is going to give you a great result. So, um, okay. All right. So um, the idea behind the algorithm is to characterize the weight of the MST in terms of the number of connected components in various subgraphs of G, and then use that algorithm for estimating the number of connected components. Okay. So why should MST be related to any type of connected component problem? Um, so it comes out of, actually, I forgot which algorithm it is. There's all those names and one of them looks like this. So I'll, maybe you guys can tell me, but let's just take an example. Let's say the weights are all either one or two. Okay. Well, then the MST weight is the weight, the number of weight one edges plus two times the number of weight two edges. That doesn't really help me. Let me rewrite this. Every edge contributes one. And the number of weight two edges contribute an extra one. So it's really n minus one plus the number of weight two edges. Okay, so here's like my example with weight one edges and weight two edges. Um, I don't know if you can see that these are red. Okay, so the connected component, um, so now I wanna say, what is that? How many weight edge two edges do I need to put in? Well, first I'm gonna put in as many weight one edges as I can. Uh, so I'm gonna find a subtree here. Um, with as many weight one edges as I can, but I can't add that guy in because it would make a cycle. And I can't connect these guys with weight one edges because there isn't one. So I just put in as many as I can. And then how many weight two edges do I need to put in? Um, well, it depends on the number of connected components induced by the weight one edges. Okay, so it's exactly a connected component, number of connected component question. Okay, um, it's actually the number of connected components minus one. Okay, so that's why n minus one became n minus two. So there was like number of connected components minus one and they moved that over, okay? So that's the relationship. And you can continue this relationship for weight one, two, three, four, up to, um, up to W. And you, it turns out everything nicely cancels and you get this really nice expression that the MST weight is n minus W plus the sum from i equals one to w minus one, the number of connected components induced by edges of weight at most i. Okay, and that turns out to be, okay, so what the algorithm does is figure out each element of this sum. It spends w time, figures out each element of this sum. Um, and then we know n, we know w, so just adds that in, and that's the estimate, right? Um, now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate each of these to within an additive factor of epsilon n over w. So I'll use like a new epsilon that's like epsilon over w. Um, and that gives an additive approximation of the MST to within epsilon n. And since we assume that each edge, since it's, we assumed it's connected and each edge has weight at least one, then the MST weight has to be at least n minus one. And therefore, um, um, an additive approximation to within epsilon n also gives you a multiplicative approximation to within one plus or minus epsilon. So that's why we're getting um, a good approximation, okay? All right, so this gives an MST algorithm with a runtime of dw squared over epsilon to the fourth or something. You can do better, um, but I didn't show it. Okay, um, and there's more work on this. Um, if you have like a certain data structure that gives you range queries, then you can get it, um, MST that's faster for Euclidean point sets, but you need that special data structure. Um, in metric MST where the distances are given by a distance matrix, 
uh, Chumai and Solar showed that you can get a one plus epsilon approximation in time O tilde of N, which is square root the size of the matrix. Um, so, so you can do sublinear in that as well. Okay, um, let me return to our first question we talked about in the beginning, which is the graph diameter question. Um, I just, I'm not gonna show it here. I always give it for homework. So you can think of it as homework if you want, um, but I'm, I'm not gonna check it. Uh, but what Parnas and Ron showed is that you can distinguish diameter K graphs from graphs that are epsilon far in, and I'll describe what I mean by epsilon far in a minute, um, from diameter K graphs in time polynomial one over epsilon. Okay, so what we mean by epsilon far is, if I have a graph, it's, it's diameter might be K, those guys I wanna pass. It's diameter might not be K, but it might be because of some like crazy little place that I didn't see in my sampling. And if I would have just added a couple of edges in there, I would have fixed the diameter. So what we mean by far is you can't even find epsilon N edges to add to fix things. It's that bad. It's like so far from being a um, diameter K that you need to add a lot of edges to make the diameter small. Okay, so what Parnas and Ron showed is that you can distinguish graphs that have diameter at most k from those that are far from diameter at most k in polynomial in one over epsilon time, completely independent of the number of nodes or even the average degree of the graph. Okay, um, that is a that is it for today. Um, but that is actually a preview of a property testing type question, which I hope to get to also tomorrow at the end of lecture. So. Um, so um, anyway, um, I'm, that's it. <laughs> okay. 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 Any questions? Okay, I think everybody is pretty uh, <laughs> talked out at this point. Uh, so if there are no questions, then let's thank Ronit again. Thank you.